all of you that are on YouTube, there's always a sense of trying to figure things out. And as you go and navigate your audience and try to figure out, okay, what type of content is gonna work on YouTube? What doesn't? Uh, we learn and grow. Now, I'm really excited for today's live stream because I actually have someone that has been on YouTube for a while now and started over here and now he's over there, which is really exciting. And ultimately as YouTube uh, introduces new formats, uh, you know, like shorts and live streams and uh, long form, you know, I think we always need to kind of be conscientious of who we're making content for and the value that we're actually bringing in to them and ultimately doing that consistently. And so I'm really, really excited for you to learn today all about what you can do to improve on YouTube and it all starts right here. Now, I can honestly say that the, the uh, biggest struggle that we face as content creators is being consistent and then ultimately knowing how to improve every single time we post a video. And for me, with my students, I always try to help them create plans, execute on those plans, and then really deep dive and analyze the things that we need to do, the things that we can improve upon, things that worked, things that didn't work, and then really hone in the uh, modification, which is the adjustment of the new plan moving forward. And so really excited for the student today because I met him a while back and I really loved his content. I, I, I really did. And it was kind of hit or miss. And, and, and then two, he had some series that worked really, really well, which I can't wait to kind of deep dive into that. And ultimately it's like, okay, what next? What do we do? How do we actually come up with these ideas? And I'm excited for you to meet uh, Hafu. So let me uh, bring in Hafu. Hafu, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, I, I'm really excited for the conversation today because I, you know, know of your journey um, on YouTube, and and it's not it's not um, unfamiliar with a lot of content creators of what they're doing here today. So I think you're going to bring a lot of value for them. And so, just in short, would you just kind of share what your channel's about, and then and then how you got started? Yeah, I mean, my channel took a lot of twists and turns, so. Initially, my channel was a um, college vlog channel. So that's where I started. Like in first year of university, I was kind of lost, just looking for a hobby. And um, I picked up YouTube as something that I just wanted to try. So I bought a, like a $300 used camera off of Craigslist. It didn't have <laughs> autofocus. Canon e 3 i no autofocus. That was um, a good camera though back in the day though. Come on now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I did that and I just made vlogs of my life of my school life and stuff like that. And that's how I got started. And, um, along the way, I took a lot of twists and turns. Uh, eventually I graduated university and I'm like, can't be doing college vlogs all day. Right. Cause I don't want to go back to school when I'm like 30 years old, making videos with students. It's kind of creepy. Um, so, uh, I basically did a series where I was like, I've always wanted to do this. And it was like kind of 180. It was the Shaolin training series. So I did 30 days training with a Shaolin monk. And it was like a um, entertainment series. And that's how I transitioned away from college into more entertainment and learning. And now my channel is all about um, learning different niche hobbies, different skills, and just exploring my curiosities. Yeah, no, I, I love it. I love the, the evolution of the journey. In fact, I was watching your first video that you posted. I don't know if it was your actual first video or if you 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 unlisted your first video, but it was a cooking video. I'm like, what the like I didn't even I didn't even know that you did cooking. You know, yeah. you had like this cooking tip or whatever. Um and I, I wanna I wanna kind of dive into that because uh, I know with your background, uh, you loved acting and you loved uh, performing. And and why why did you start with a cooking video? Like, what, was it just because it was like a cooking video in, in college, or was that just was that even prior of doing college content? No. Um, so like like I said, I was trying to like find things that I wanted to do, right? So like I just made whatever that came to mind, and at the time. I had a very like special diet. All I ate every single day was chicken breast and kale. 
So like, <laughs> I, I cook kale for some of my friends, and they're like, "This is the best kale I've ever had because it was like tender and it wasn't bitter because I like stir fried yeah, yeah. it." So I just made a kale cooking tutorial. <laughs> Okay, I, I love that. I love that for multiple reasons. Cause you're just like, okay, it's all I ate, kale and, and chicken. Um, now let's kind of let's kind of dive into it. So at the time um that that you posted your first video, were you thinking in your head, I'm gonna create YouTube content, I'm gonna be a YouTube creator, or was it just I'm gonna post a video just to show my friends how to cook for the kale? Like what was what was going through your thought? No, I was, it wasn't that serious. I mean, like, I was just like, I was just like wanting to get a video out. It was just kind of like, uh, I had an idea. I wanted to create the idea. That's great. That's great. And then that evolved into, uh, you know, making content as a student. And um, what, where did you get like, and I know this is so long ago, so if you can't remember, it's fine. But um, where did you get your inspiration of, you know, how to do YouTube? Like, what, what was the channels that you're watching? Or was there anything that was inspiring you at the time? Um, when you're creating content? Or you just pull out the your, your Canon and $300 camera and start vlogging? Um, it was back in the vlog days, actually. So Casey Neistat was daily vlogging at the time when I started. Yeah. So that that was like a huge inspiration. Every day I wake up and start my day with a Casey Neistat vlog. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And you're like, okay, that's so cool. And I'm going to go do this. That's great. And so did you uh, did you try to do a daily vlog? Or were you just doing a weekly? Or what was your kind of your strategy at the time? <laughs> strategy is like a bit of an overkill of a word. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I had much strategy. Um, I, I, I just went at the pace that I could because, like, I would had no skills going into YouTube. Yeah. Like my first video, I was uh, learning to edit with a YouTube tutorial on the side while I was editing the video. So, like, I I couldn't upload that fast, but I was like about weekly. You know, I was like uploading pretty like consistently in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I love that because, I mean, we, we all love YouTube for multiple reasons. And I can't tell you how many people are like, oh, I want to learn this. And so they have YouTube. They have like a, a player in and they're trying to do it at the same time and then trying to get the stuff out. It's, it's so great. Um, OK, so when when did it start to get uh, get serious for you? Like like this is something that you wanted to do and you wanted to do, you know, for for your work. Like what when did that actually start? Hmm. It took a long time, actually. I mean, I was still studying, right? So like school was my primary focus, but I kind of view university and college and school kind of like a playground because it's like a safety net, right? Like I can yep. focus on other things. For example, YouTube, if that fails, I'll just go back to focusing on studying. <laughs> so that's how I view things. So um, like, I really didn't do YouTube full time until like two years after I graduated. Okay. Uh, but every um, but ever since like my first viral video when I was like vlogging, it was like a day in the life of a UBC student that got like 50k views within a week. So yeah. after that video, I took it a little bit more seriously, where I'm like, I'm committed to making videos. I didn't think of it like as a job. I didn't want to make money from it. But I, I committed myself to making videos. Yeah. So when that first video took off and it was kind of like the day in the life of, and I, I actually watched that video. That was one of the videos that I, that I prepped for. Um, but that day in the life and you're like, Oh my goodness, like there's a lot of people that were interested in this video. And, and I, I would assume that it, it, it generated a little bit more money than your other, your other uh, videos. But was it just the success of the number of views and the, the, the type of comments that were there that kind of fueled your fire to want to create more content? Or was it going, hey, this is actually doable. I, I was able to succeed on this one. What happens when I really hone in on this and really focus in on this? Um, I mean, I think it was like... I finally saw some light uh, after like a year of despair. Because <laughs> cause, um, I remember vividly there was like one video where it was uh, BuzzFeed was also very popular at the time. Right. So I was trying to like copy BuzzFeed style. So it was like best coffee shops in Vancouver where I lived. And that video took me like 
50 to 100 hours to like wow. film, edit, and everything. And when I publish it, I got 200 views. That was like very demoralizing. Yeah. So, so finally seeing a video get more than like a thousand views within a week, that was just very exciting. Just seeing the numbers like go up and feeling a little bit rewarded for the amount of effort I put in. Yeah, that's one thing. If I um, if I look back of all the the people that started YouTube and the point where they're about ready to quit, not saying that you're in that in that scenario, but it was just like they put so much time, energy and effort and passion behind a project. And then when they release it, it's just like, OK, no one watched this. Like, like, you know, we kind of had a couple hundred people, but it, it deserves to have more, you know, more views and and just all the energy and effort. And it can get super demoralizing, like what you said. Um, and and I know I, for the people in the live stream right now, I think all of us at one time or another um, have have fell into that category. Right. Like we get really excited about a channel. We get really excited about a video. And, and then you just, you, you put a lot of energy and effort into it and then it's just like, does nothing. <laughs> um, and so when, when that happened to you, what did you do? Cause I think, cause I, I would really like to, to define this cause were you, you probably weren't full time at the time, right? No. Um, I okay. And so what, what did you do? It's just like, oh man, maybe, maybe I shouldn't put so much effort into it or this, they don't, they don't want that. Or was it just the bad topic or what, what do you, what was kind of going through your mind? Um, I mean, like I wouldn't say uh, so. OK, so there were a couple of videos I uploaded and like initially it was fun. It was fun to do. Right. Um, and then like it became hard work because yeah. it was like a lot of work editing these videos. Um, at the time, I was a student. I was like young and I had a habit of like quitting things when they got hard. And I recognized that about myself because like there were a lot of skills or like hobbies I try to pick up, but then I just quit when I, it was getting really hard. So um, I made a promise to myself that I would stick with YouTube for a year, no matter what results I got. So wow. that's what got me through it. Wow. So, so you, you set a goal, Hey, I'm going to do this for a year. I'm going to be consistent for a year. I don't care about the results. I'm going to just create content. And um, that that's pretty powerful. I think I think a lot of people can learn from that. Uh, just because I think they, they so, they're so focused in on the numbers um, that they miss out on on the joy of creating and connecting and and really, you know, going through that process. And, and I think for you to do that, that's great. And then in that year, did did you ha have a video take off and it brought more energy and excitement and and um, and then you kind of honed in on it. You said, okay, I can do this. Yeah. I mean, uh, for sure. There were like uh, a couple of videos that like got, uh, good views. Um, but like I was averaging like a couple hundred views per video. Um, and then I also got mixed signals. So like that kale video got like a hundred K views, but yeah, I didn't want to yeah. I didn't want to be a cooking channel. Yeah. <laughs> so like I, I almost became a cooking channel too, because I'm like, this is getting a lot of views. Should I do this? But, I <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. It was, it was just like a lot of like trial and error, I guess. Yeah. Just like my goal was like, kind of like proving it to myself that I could do it for a year. Yeah, and, and I think I think too a lot of content creators feel pigeonholed if they have a video that take off. I guess that's what my audience wants, and then that's what they create, um, and 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 they make a decision, and it just becomes um, not fun. <laughs> like like there's no passion behind it. You're like, oh, I, I guess that's what the algorithm wants or the YouTube gods want, and that's all they do. Um, but you you didn't necessarily do that. You you saw okay, there's success there. Um, but you kind of leaned in and started creating content that that you were passionate about. And then two, um, one thing that I did notice is is it started to evolve. You, you thought, okay, what what's this internet stuff? Like what what's gonna be you know more clickable, you know from from videos from the internet. And I know the BuzzFeed was kind of one of those things and then you kind of branched out from there. But when when you graduated and two years after the fact, and you're like, okay, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna make this 
uh, my my business. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna do this full time. Um, what was your strategy? I mean, I, I would assume that you were getting some views that you're like, okay, this this can be um, this can support us. Um, but what was the strategy right out of the gate? Well, actually, I didn't go full time right after I graduated. So well, like um, two years after, right? Didn't you get it? Yeah, like two years. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So like. I, I was working at a job um, and because it was like almost COVID. So mm -hmm. like, <laughs> I like, it was half, like one of those years was COVID. Like I was able to save up enough money where I, I would be comfortable like living, <laughs> just like I can survive. Got so it. that gave me a lot of confidence to like kind of quit the job and go full time onto YouTube. And what did your family think <laughs> when you like put it, put it aside and you're like, okay, I'm going, you know, I'm going to do YouTube full time. Well, I mean, bro, I'm Asian. <laughs> like, do, do tell, do, do tell. Uh, I mean, like my parents are very like traditional, right? Cause yeah. it, like, um, when I was doing uh youtube during like one of the summer years during school like during the summer during school year my dad was like really hounding me to get a job like a like, a real job <laughs> yeah yeah like i worked at the call center at lululemon so like yeah, yeah um like they obviously didn't know what youtube was they didn't know that was a viable career path and they thought i was just like slacking you know yeah. i was just on the computer you're like slacking but um with asian parents if you don't ask them for money like uh, eventually they'll come around to it <laughs> like if they can see that you're like surviving by yourself yeah you're fine. <laughs> that, that that's great that's great so let's let's kind of um go into the shaolin series like that like that's when i actually um found your channel is with that series i thought it was really really a great idea um and and i want to i want to go through um what why why was that something that you felt like you wanted to create and then what did you learn from creating it and posting it i, I think that's that's really important for a lot of people that are here because i think they're really passionate and they might be hesitant to actually create a certain piece of content because it's not like what the current content they they have been creating because this was a pretty big shift uh for you uh and your channel yeah it was um like i said like at the time like i wasn't uh the most strategic about it i was kind of just like kind of gun ho about it so my video right before the shaolin series was like studying 24 hours with the smartest students so like it was like a very like student centric video and then uh it was covid actually no it was, was it covid um yeah it was covid actually yeah it was, it COVID. was COVID. covid time yeah yeah, yeah yep. it was covid so like i was kind of stuck in my house uh, i couldn't do the series that i wanted to do which was i had a series where um i travel around to different campuses and give campus tours called campus crawl so that was like the best performing series at the time, but I couldn't travel. So I'm like, what can I do in my hometown? And one of the ideas that came up was like, as a kid, I was always fascinated by like Kung Fu, Shaolin stuff. And one of my friends told me that there was a Shaolin monk in my town. So really? that's how that happened. So like I reached out to him um, and then like, we talked and after like a month of like deliberation between like me and proposing to like the Shaolin Temple and stuff, like I finally got it to work. And uh, that's how I made the series happen. Yeah, so at that time, you've probably been uh, evolving as a creator in the sense that you're getting editing down, you understand some some concepts. Um, and then and then you had this idea, this very passionate idea, which is completely opposite of everything that you've been doing. Um, you know, which was more, hey, this is all student type content and here's what you can do, you know, um, in dating or, you know, I think you traveled like 10,000 miles for a blind date or whatever. There's certain things that were there, but it was like more college centric. Yeah. And then you're going to do something that you're super passionate about. And and then how did you approach it? So you, you talked to him, which is great. 
um, and you got them on board, but how did you approach how you wanted to create the video? Um, because um, what, what were you thinking in a series or were you just thinking one video at the time? No, I proposed like a six video series. So, so I wanted did... to be, yeah, okay. like I wanted to be like kind of like the modern day karate kid where there was like a storyline between all the episodes. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. So, so you're thinking, okay, this is going to go at least six videos and, and I'm going to put all my energy and effort into it. And uh, you did. And, and were you capturing multiple videos at the same time? Or did you do one video, get it ready, and then post it? Like, what was your, what was your process then? Um, we filmed about like four videos before we started posting. That's so great. That's so great. Well, I want to I want to kind of pull up the page itself if we can, and we'll just kind of we'll kind of glance at it right here. So, so we have this uh, Shaolin series right here, surviving twenty four hours with the Shaolin Kung Fu Master, um, and and when you when you posted that, um, you already had four other videos. Well, I guess three other videos, including this, uh, excluding this one, um, that was was ready to go. Did this video right out of the gate just start to pop off or did it wait a week or two? Was it a couple days? What 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 was happening there? Do you remember? Yeah, I remember exactly. Um, so that's why I said like I wasn't I didn't have the best strategy at the time. I would do it differently now if I were able to go back. But at the time, you can see like the previous two videos got like pretty good views. Um, yep, like, yep, right here. Yep. And then when I posted the Shaolin one right out of the gate, I think it was like a five out of 10. Like it wasn't like, it wasn't the worst. It wasn't the yeah. best. And it actually took, I think around three months before the video like hit a million views. But then after it hit a million views, like YouTube found the audience and it just like pushed out to like a big audience. Yeah. Yeah. I want to, I want to talk about this because this right here is when you go from a certain type of content to a different type of content. Um, it, 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 it takes a little time and I think everybody expects, Oh, I put all this energy and effort into it. If it's a good video, it's a good video and YouTube will do its thing of getting it in front of the right type of people if it's done right. So, um, you, uh, you said very specifically, you do it differently. Um, and that's what I want to kind of hone in on. How would you do it if you're doing it now? Because this is what I believe all co content creators need to learn, uh, is what would be the intentionality and the process that you'd go through, um, when you're doing this series now. Instead of doing a 180 pivot, I would pivot very slowly. So instead of like going from student to Shallon, which is like completely unrelated, I would probably like split it that up into like different buckets like points <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I basically go like maybe like student and then like go somewhere like into like learning into like maybe like training or something like yeah basically yeah. like small pivots until yeah. i eventually can hit with the video that i want to make yeah now i want to talk about why you would do that uh, because this did work. I mean, it, it, it did go just within 30, you know, 30 or 40 days or whatever it was, it did work. Why are you more apt to do that? Uh, uh, what your current strategy would be now, uh, looking back versus, versus what you did. There's a couple of reasons. One is like, after I published the Shallon video and like it completely went viral, after three months, my channel was a different channel. It was like a completely different audience than what I had before. It wasn't students anymore. It was like yep. people interested in like Kung Fu. Yep. So I wasn't able to keep my like audience initially. So right. you'll lose a lot of people if you just go 180. And then the second thing is like uh, the performance of the videos uh, could have been better if yeah. I transitioned slowly. 
Yeah. So I want to I want to go kind of with my thoughts on this because I don't see it being out of line. I, I do agree with you in the sense that you'd be a lot more strategic in trying to figure out okay what is the best content strategy based on your current viewers. And so one thing that I always do, and Hafu knows this because he's one of my students, is just like I'm really obsessed with what's happening right now on a channel. Like I, I really want to look at real time analytics and know what's happening. And he had some really amazing videos that that were performing really well, where it dealt with uh, students, and and so how do we actually build that out so that that you're not losing the audience that you've developed, but you're you're exploring uh, with that audience the things that can t lead them where they need to go. So, for me, I think your your strategy of what you do now is really sound because. Uh, realistically, you're a student of from a Shaolin master too. You know, if you if you really uh, uh, you know that story didn't change. You're just kind of going out of the classroom into um, the Shaolin temple, right? Um, and so there's there's that opportunity, but doing it where um, you're leading them along the way, where they feel like they're a part of of this journey. Because I, I can guarantee you. Um, if, if it was uh, the audience was like super invested to see what you're going to do next and and it's it's related or somewhat related to what you currently have done, they're going to be more apt to click and they're going to be more apt to watch because they liked liked your content before. Because I mean, you had a couple videos, it's like studying for 24 hours, had like 5.9 million uh, views on it. And I think that could have happened after too, but you know, at the time it could have had a million views or whatever. But, um, and then you had some other, other things there. And so I think um, one thing, and you know this, uh, that I want everyone to understand is like, be very strategic in your content strategy. Just don't always say, oh, this is a banger video, we got to put it out now. It's like, okay, how can we how can we build momentum to that banger video or that banger series? And and that's what you're basically saying here. Um, and so once um, once you started to get into the Shaolin series, um, that, that literally transformed because it took, you know, two or three months and then it started to get momentum and you had other videos that were really engaging at that time. And and you got really honed in on a Kung Fu viewer audience um and did you feel kind of stuck at the same time as you were you know what you did in the beginning with cooking videos like hey this is really performing do i always have to do this like where where were you at in your thought process yeah um so like after my six videos of the shaolin kung fu stuff uh before I published Kung Fu, I was at 250,000 subscribers. And yeah. after I published Kung Fu, I was at 500,000 subscribers. So half of my channel was basically from the Kung Fu audience. And like, I tried publishing a couple of videos that weren't Kung Fu related. They didn't. Yeah, it was, I uh, dated yeah. seven girls in seven days and this happened. Then I dated seven girls in seven days and this happened part two. <laughs> And then surviving on a penny, uh, but the, the penny one is actually interesting. I want to talk about that in a second, but um, yeah, I would say that's completely the opposite, <laughs> you know, from the viewer. If they're like, "Oh, I'm totally into this kung fu series," and then yeah, uh, yeah, I, it's I like it. from like celibacy to like the opposite <laughs> of celibacy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so uh, um, no, no, um, yeah, but uh, so like at the time, I think my mindset was it's like. Oh, I'm just gonna do whatever goes viral, and the Kung Fu stuff went viral. Yeah, and then I'm like, okay, I want to make more viral videos, and what's viral like challenge videos. So yeah. I tried a couple like real life challenge videos. Actually, they did really, really bad. I deleted them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, so that like basically gave me like a hint. It's like you can't just really do 180 pivots like all the yeah. time. Because I tried it before, it kind of worked out, but then I tried it this time, it didn't work out. So that's when I started getting a little smarter. So instead of doing um, just any challenge, I started doing fitness challenges, yep. which is very related to what yep. I was doing with the Kung Fu Master. Yep. And, and I think, too, it's like it's like when when you're creating content, your video should be standalone. 
and and they should be able to consume it, get everything from it. But it's about the journey and the connection to the content and you as a creator. And if you, it, it, and this is why I want everyone to know, because like like Coffee knows this, uh, you know, um, for sure. But when when uh, a viewer watches specific content, and you release something that's not related or it's so 180, it's still going to show up on their homepage. Um, it's going to come up because they're an active viewer at that time. They're an active viewer. They just watch the stuff. And if they go, what the heck is this? And they don't click on it and they just skip it. That that actually sends a message to uh, YouTube when you put other content, they might not see it. They might not see your other videos. And so momentum's really important, especially when it comes to where the views are coming from and the relationship of those views with uh, with current videos. And so uh, what, what he said is really sound in the sense of, hey, guess what? If I'm making Kung Fu videos, I'm gonna move into fitness because it's not that far removed. It's not 180 completely going dating, but it's not that far removed. And then, and then it can kind of have me go closer because it's really a challenge video. I'm trying things, I'm doing stuff that's uh, extreme with my body or whatever, and it's, you know, fitness challenges or whatever, and it's going closer down the road. Um, I wanna, um, I think this is where we met. Cause I, I remember you were, um, kind of frustrated with, oh, I just don't want to just do, you know, um, Shaolin, uh, Kung Fu type videos. Um, and then, and I want to, I want to go to this, um, the Bo Staff one, uh, because the Bo Staff is still kind of related, but then I want to go to this, I tried the world's hardest exercise. Cause, cause like that, that is pretty much what you're saying here. Um, it's like, okay, I'm doing an exercise. It's not that far out. And I want to, I want to, uh, hone in on that one. So, uh, go through the concept of what the, um, the idea was with the Bo staff, the Bo staff, uh, from scratch, what's the value for the viewer. And then let's go right into the same thing with the world's hardest exercise. What's the value for the viewer? Well, I think one thing that people loved about the Kung Fu series was, uh, there was a journey, like there was an end goal. Um, they obviously love uh, Master Yen Di, which was my teacher. Yeah. And then they loved like how hard everything was like looking. So um, I didn't have like a like like another teacher that was able to replace Master Yen Di because he is such a character. Yeah. Um, but I was able to like pick up like hard exercises and have like an end goal. So that's kind of what I did with the bow staff. Like I was learning all these tricks and I wanted to like perform the tricks at the end of the video. Same thing with uh, uh, world's hardest exercise. I wanted to see if I could recreate the hardest exercises. Yeah, yeah, that, and, and that's great. And I really like the, the thumbnail and I think it's just like really, uh, it, it pulls you in. And then, and then it did, I tried Thor, uh, love and thunder workout routine, um, with once again, that that's awesome. Um, and then, and then you did uh, basketball. I trained like Steph Curry for seven days. Um, and I, I think this is kind of where you got your rhythm down in the sense of, I tried, I trained, I learned, you know, aspect. Um, and, and what, uh, did you do at, at, at this time when you're like, okay, I'm now moving and, and I'm, I'm starting to see I can do other type of content that's just not uh, Kung Fu related, martial arts related, but it's like, okay, I'm doing a training series and, and, and now I'm doing even basketball. What did you learn from that about your audience? And then two, how did that change your decision making for your future content? Well, I learned my audience really likes like fitness stuff, like anything fitness. So like, just physical challenges. I know that's what they liked. Um, and then also at the time, those videos were like getting a couple million views each. It gave me a lot of confidence to execute what was in my mind. Yeah. And like, I think a big part of what makes a great creator is that they have a sense of what will go viral and what will connect with the audience. Yeah. Like before they even put it out, they know, oh, this one's going to hit and this one's going to hit. And at that time when I was creating those fitness challenge videos, 
I felt like I was getting more in tune with that sense. Yeah, I love that. Um, and were you still editing at the time or did you ha hire an editor um, that was editing for you? I had an editor, uh, but then like I still edited. Like, okay. uh, so they kind of assemble it and then you'd kind of create it to that point. Yeah, and some videos I was like editing by myself as well. Okay, okay. Um, so I want to, I want to talk about that YouTube six sense of like, you like, Oh, I know it's going to hit. I call it, it's going to bang, you know, the same, same thing. Right. But it's just like, you, you, you can feel it. And, and why is it just the confidence level of what's happened before? Or is this like, no, you're starting to look at the data now, or you're starting to see the comments in that way where, you know, Oh, this will actually continue the story or it will go deeper because there's a great storytelling here. Um, what gives you the confidence of just knowing something will hit? It's kind of like training an AI, AI algorithm, uh, but the AI is your brain. <laughs> you, just, like, you just feed it enough data. Like It's like, this yeah. video does well, this video doesn't do well, this video does well, this the video doesn't do well. And they re read the comments from every video. It's like, oh yeah, people like this, didn't like this. And eventually you have enough data to make like an edu edu educated guess. Yeah. So I, I love that. I love it. And I, I do think that as you start to understand your content, your audience, how they engage with your audience, you can anticipate what they're going to like and what they're not going to like. And, and every uh, top creator I've ever worked with, um, they really, really hone in on the viewer in the sense of, oh, I really am passionate about this and they're going to really love this or eh, maybe I'm not going to do this. That's not the best way uh, based on previous information. Now, 10 months ago, um, you're training, you're training, you're doing whatever, and you decided not to do a fitness challenge. Um, and it was, I learned to solve the Rubik's cube in under 60 seconds. Um, I want to, I want to talk about that one very specifically because once again, it's in the, like, I would still say it's in a challenge video, but it's not, it's not as physical as your other stuff. Why did you decide to do that? Because that that is a pretty big leap if you really look at it. I, I can see fitness with with uh, kung fu, but now here you're doing trying to solve a Rubik's cube. What what was going through your mind on that? A um, couple things. Uh, first of all, like when I started, so right after the kung fu series, I've always had it in the back of my head that. I wanted to like pivot away from Kung Fu. Are we still alive? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just I was just letting you take the full oh, frame, but okay, it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was confused. <laughs> I thought we crashed. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, you're good. Um yeah, in the back of my brain, I was like, eventually I want to pivot away from Kung Fu and pivot away from fitness challenges so I can just eventually like be able to create a challenge video on anything I wanted to do. That was always my back of the head strategy. So I did it with a um, basketball video that, that gave me more confidence because like basketball isn't really like a workout thing. It's right. not like a pump food thing. And then I did the bow staff, which is eh, kind of related. And then I did um, the Rubik's Cube one, which was a big leap of faith. Uh, I, it was kind of like a test video. I'm like, is the audience going to connect with this one, even though if it's not like a physical challenge? And initially, actually, it did pretty well. Um, I think when I published it, it was like a one or two out of 10. So like that gave me a lot of confidence to pivot into like the learning challenges. Yeah. And I what I love about Hafu is a great learner, you know, congratulations. And, you know, there's a lot of replies and people from that. And, and so basically it was like, it's an experiential channel, right? So it's like, you're going to go experience, you're going to go learn, you're going to go uh, do something that's going to be hard, and you're going to try to pull it off. Um, and then two, um, the, the thing that I love, and, and what what uh, what you did is um, the frustrations of a Rubik's Cube. I think there's a lot of people that know, okay, Rubik's Cube is pop culture. Um, and I know that there's been people at different times get frustrated with a Rubik's cube. I think when I got one, when I was eight, I like peeled off the stickers and like put them just like, <laughs> yeah, you did. even though like, you're not supposed to do that. Right. But it's like, cause that was like pre YouTube, I couldn't figure it out. But, um, but I, I think everyone can see it. And then two, um, I think you learned a lot 
from from all the data of what people would do. And you're like, okay, you're gonna do something, not just solve a Rubik's cube, but you're gonna do it under 60 seconds. And so like, ooh, can he actually do it? Is this something that he's actually able to do? And there's some great storytelling because it's like, okay, it's not about solving a Rubik's cube, but it's just doing it under uh, a lot of pressure and trying to do it under time. Um, and, and, and one element I kept in that video was like the teacher role. So I was collaborating with Soup Timmy, which yeah. kind of like the Master Yandi version of Rubik's Cubes. Yeah. Now, I, I'm glad you brought that up because this right here is what a lot of people miss of what you just brought, brought in. So there was a master student role. Uh, in a lot of your videos, okay? It's just like, if I'm gonna try something, I need to learn from someone. And and then it's a collaboration in the sense of me helping, uh, you know, me helping me learn this specific trait, but that's the content. Like that, that is the content. And, and for you to do it, you could have tried to solve it. You could have done it on YouTube or whatever, where you're trying to go from there, but no, no, no. You wanted to bring someone in to give you tips and techniques and things to learn. And then it, it, it does a multiple things because you can say someone is literally mastered solving the Rubik's cube. I'm a beginner and I'm going to learn from them. And that, that, that is just a really, really powerful storytelling. Yeah. And, um, I think it's just like more interesting because uh, they actually have knowledge <laughs> instead of like me, like it, just me fumbling the entire video. It's not cool. Yeah, it's pretty boring. Yeah, it'd be boring, right? <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm going to try this. Okay, fumble a couple times. I mean, that would be a funny montage for like 20 seconds, but outside of that, that'd be pretty boring. Um, and so this one performed, um, you're, you're basically judging it off of two out of 10 or whatever it was. And you're like, okay, great. I've done, you know, train like Steph Curry. I'm starting to evolve. I'm doing the Rubik's cube. And, and then two, I did notice, um, on this one that it, it was, oh, well, let's do another Rubik's cube video. Like why, why did you choose to do, um, this series? And this is something that we talk about buckets and stuff like that, but, um, uh, level one to 100 Rubik's cubes. Like what was, um, what was kind of in your thought process of, of a creator? And then also why would you do this video versus doing something else of trying to learn? Why did I make the level one to 100 Rubik's cube video? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is when I actually got a little bit smarter. Hey, soup Timmy's in the chat right now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, this is when I got smarter. So like I was saying, it's like slow pivots. That's yep. the lesson I took to heart. So I saw the Rubik's Cube video was doing good, but I wanted to pivot into like even more viral videos. Yep. So I'm like, I don't want to just go and make like a Mr. Beast video. So I basically still kept the Rubik's Cube topic because topics have a huge influence on who watches the video. I kept That's the Rubik's insane, Cube right? topic, but then I changed the format into a more viral format. It's like a showcase of different Rubik's Cubes. So that, that was my thinking process at the time. Yeah, and I, I, love, I love what you said. It's just like small tweaks, uh, small pivots, you know, as you're, as you're going, and then, and then increasing the story because in that video, guaranteed, if they didn't watch the first video, that YouTube would say, oh, here's a video that's related and it's gonna show up and you're, it's gonna lift both videos up. And then two, um, I really love the format, the uh, level one to 100. That's a, that's, a, that's a format that works really well in gaming and a few other things from there. And, and uh, you adopted it to be a part of your content because you're like, hey, this is a great way to take a, a, a viewer through a journey through the video. And the mechanism is level one versus to level 100 and what you need to do, you know, through that whole process. Um, and and it's, it's, it's something that um, can be uh, replicatable as well, you know, around that series. And we'll get to that here in a second. Um, but um, why did that one get 4.5 million views versus the 1.6 million views uh, from your first, uh, you know, solving the Rubik's Cube under under a minute? 
think he's just cooler, man. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is. It's just like, that's a banger. That is literally a banger thumbnail. You know, it really is. It, and it's a good idea, banger thumbnail. But you probably learn stuff from that first original one. And you're like, ooh, if I tried this or if I could do this in that video, um, it, it should it should perform well. Um, I I look at it as like I I've never seen a Rubik's cube like that. So I'm like, ooh, that, like I'm I'm leaning in on that. A oh, funny story about it. this. Uh, after I published this level one to one hundred Rubik's cube video, like a bunch of the Rubik's cube channels started copying this <laughs> video. <laughs> <laughs> so you set the trend. I love it. I love it. Yeah, no, that that's great. That's great. And then too, if they post similar content, then then your video is going to be recommended <laughs> because they're they're kind of saying, okay, here's some new audience that's coming in, um, and and you're able to kind of evolve from there. So love that. So um, what I what I want to do is go through just the last few of your videos. Uh, because it seems like you got a rhythm down now and you're really having a strategy. And then I want to, I want to go back to shorts because we haven't talked about shorts yet. And, um, uh, one thing, um, I, I know that we had in our mastery call for our students, like I, I, I'm actually a fan of the channel. I, I, I'm, I'm one of your viewers and I love the content. Um, and, um, I know that, um, a lot of people struggle with being consistent and really hitting the viewer. And I, I don't feel like you've ever deviated. Once you got into the rhythm, I don't think you ever deviated from um, the, the, what makes you unique um, and your style and your humor and your, uh, in, the entertainment in the videos. I just, I really enjoy it. And so I wanna, I wanna talk about this, um, the yo-yo one. Um, so so we, we know that there's formats, so level one to 100. Uh, Rubik's cube, okay, because you try that new format. It's the, it's kind of the mechanism in the video, and then um, I know that Mr. Beast and and others do like one versus the the super expensive whatever. Um, this format is by far uh, different. Now now um, from the title thumbnail, it's different. Uh, could you explain about the yo-yos concept? Was it just buying yo-yos? Was it engaging with yo like learning yo-yos? Was it being involved with yo-yos? How did this? How how was this building upon your content strategy? Well, I mean, the title is different, but like the video itself, in terms of the structure, is actually very similar. It's, I, 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 we call it like the segmented approach. I don't know what other people call it, but like yep. it's just like different segments of like showcasing different yo-yos. So technically, it's the same as the Rubik's cube one, but just in the yo-yo one, I um, also learned tricks along the way. So and, and just were you tricks. were you just learning tricks online, or did you have a master or no? It was coming? like the Australian yo-yo champion. Exactly, exactly. So so th this is where a lot of creators go wrong is they don't see the elements for their content. They just, they just don't, they think, oh, all it is is like a, a one to 100 video or whatever, or, you know, I'm learning this, but you, you realize, no, 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 I need someone to teach me. And the more credibility, if it's like soup, soup Timmy or whatever, you know, that's great. They're gonna help bring credibility. And, and, and then two, they're gonna teach me very specific things. And then two, having the Australia yo-yo uh, champion, that, that's it's great because that is great storytelling, but it's still the components that make your content you unique and what people are looking for. And so it, by, by doing this, if you didn't do that, then it would be like, okay, what is he trying to do here now? Uh, because it's those small, subtle things that, that actually uh, uh, create consistency in the content strategy. And, and that's what I love about your content is it's really, really engaging and good. Um, so um, the yo-yo one, um, and then and then we'll go uh, these last few uh, few ones. Uh, then you did another one to 100 science experiments. That's a dope, um, you know, uh, dope thumbnail. And then your Lego one, like, it seems like you got your rhythm down now, um, and and then has has that improved your ideation? Like, how how do you go through your ideation process based on what you're doing currently right now? Like, what's what's your process of figuring out what you want to do next? Um, 
my ideation process is actually pretty unique uh, because I, I work with a small team right now, about six people. And on a weekly basis, we do a pitch meeting. So everybody comes with their own like five to 10 ideas. And then we hop on a call and we go through them. And we basically like, it's kind of like free flowing process. Uh, at the end of the day, the goal is, is this a viral topic or not? And there's no like exact like filters that we're putting on this, but like over time we just learn things. And like as a team, we kind of like, kind of have a sense of what's going to work and what's not going to work. So that's how I go about ideating. Has there ever been someone that brought a really bad idea that turned into a banger idea? Like did, did it evolve into that based on that discussion or how did that work? Yeah, plenty of times. So like in the ideation process, I mean, in the pitch meetings, we're not really looking for like a finished idea. I mean, that'd be great. But if they bring like elements, we can use that as like a seed to generate a different idea. For example, if they bring like a thumbnail and a title as a package, but then I don't like the title, but I really like the thumbnail, then I can come up with another idea just based off that thumbnail. Like, yeah, you know, it's just yeah, like I love it. Brainstorm and, then, and then once you lock that in, what's your process from there? Like, what do you what do you do next? Um, uh, it'll be research and seeing like what's logistically possible and like what can we do within that? Like, for example, let's say it was like we came out with level one to 100 yo-yos or like one dollar to one hundred thousand dollar yo-yo. We just research like what are the yo-yos that are fitting within right. that title? Right. And, and then, and then you're starting to get all the yo-yos and then probably stories and then realize that, Oh, this is a weapon in the Philippines and you know, this whole, this whole thing. And then, and then how do you start telling the story? Do you do, you do, do a lot of prep work of saying, Hey, we're getting ready to record. This is kind of the flow. Like how do you go through the flow process of what your video is going to be? Um, a part of it comes into the research process where are kind of like organizing which like segments would go where. And then another part of it would depend on the subject matter expert. So like they might want to do things a certain way. Or they might want to teach things a certain way. So it's like a lot of back and forth. Well, let's, let's talk about that because I think a lot of people, um, when they do collaborations, they do it way wrong. It's not a collaboration. It's just more you're inserting someone into your video, right? And so you're reaching out to the subject matter expert and, and let's just use the yo-yo as an example. So you reached out to them, say, Hey, you want to do this video? They say, yes. Um, and, and then two, what are the questions that you ask them? um on how to collaborate together and what to get out of them because like if they they're obsessed and they're an expert at it they've gone through a lot of experience yeah so like i think the unique perspective that i provide is that one i'm a beginner and two i know what appeals to mass audiences whereas mm -hmm. subject matter experts a lot of the times they're like too in the weeds about their skill so they don't know what's interesting and what's not interesting. So having the combination of both is what makes the videos interesting. So like, I know what's interesting to the audience and they know like what's needed in order to like learn the skill. And I basically like tweak what's needed in, in like a more entertaining way. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that. So through, through a lot of conversations and you're starting to figure out, okay, this is going to be the flow of the video. Here's the story. This is the mechanisms. And then to, um, here's, here's the shareable moments that would work really well in the video. Um, and then I, I hope everyone that's watching this just understood what you said, because this is some of the most valuable content for YouTubers, like, especially if you're bringing outside parties in. Um, but I, I even look at it as like even having, you know, um, any, any type of content, you'd be doing the same thing. You're just kind of looking through the, 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 the vein of the viewer, but then too, how are you going to make it interesting in the other part of the world that you're experiencing? Right? So if it's like, oh, I'm hiding, like, let's just use one, you know, you're hiding in the world's scariest castle or whatever. It's just like, you know, going into it, if you know who your viewer is and what to expect, 
Um, and then two, what are some of the elements that can really amplify the storytelling, right? And like, wh well, why is it the most scariest, you know, place in the world or whatever? What what led to this? And, you know, you're doing research and so on. So you have these elements that are interesting along the way that leads to the journey of why are you doing it? And then what's going to happen through the process? And there's a lot of surprise and delight, but there needs to be elements to keep them in. And the only way to do it is when a content creator really understands their audience with the value that they're coming. And then two, understanding, oh, it's much greater and better than what we're what we're actually thinking because we've we've taken the time to do the research or to connect with our our, our, our collaborator uh, from there. So I, I really love that. Um, so before we switch on to uh, shorts, because I, I think a lot of people have questions like, how do you do sh your short strategy and long form strategy? Um, do, you, do you enjoy making long form content? Is this, does it feel like a job or do you, or you just wake up and you're like, man, I get to make videos? Like what's, where are you at with this? No, sometimes I miss the days where I can just like pick up a camera and vlog, you know, and that'd be, that'd be the video. I call it a day. <laughs> <laughs> but nowadays, like we do a little bit more elaborate things. There's like more like moving pieces. Like we got to find people. We got to find like uh, props and like, like stuff like that. Do a lot of research. So it's, it's a longer process than yeah. what it was before. But yeah. um, I still find it enjoyable. It, it's still like very, um, it's very, like what I loved is two things. One, I love learning. So like I just like, I love learning about like different things, right? And then two, I love data and YouTube has a lot of data. Yeah. So like I'm basically combining those two into my channel. So it's like basically what I want to do. Yeah, I mean, you, you basically explain my love language, man. <laughs> I love learning and I love data. I just, and, and I, I love, I love making, uh, connections. I love seeing patterns and then, and then realizing how I can apply it, you know? And I think we're a lot alike in so many different ways. Um, maybe yeah, that's why sure. I like your content so much. I don't know, but, um, but there's, there's things that, um, that I do believe creators need to understand and it's something that you're you're well aware that I teach and preach, you know, to my students, which is have a plan and then just don't pick up the camera, like literally go in and prep for that video, like try to go in and do a lot more research instead of being uh, reactive, you're being proactive. And then once you release a video, then then analyze what worked, what didn't work, you know, could you have done it better? Like we can always do better. We can, we can, we can just always do better. What, what do we need to do better at? And then two, what, what do, does the audience, how did they, do they get what was going on? Are they disconnected? Where, where's the retention? You know, do they feel connected? You look into the comments um, and then, and then you adjust, you take that adjustment and you put it into your next video. And, and you've done that perfectly from my perspective. You're always learning, you're always growing, you're looking at the data, you're always improving, and your content has elevated quite a bit since I've been following you. Thank um, you. Um, and and what what would you say with someone that that cringes to look at data and, and what should they look at? What should they avoid? Um, what should they learn from and what should they stay away from? I mean, it's like, like, it's actually a, like a personality thing. It's like some people, they love data. Some people, they like never look at it. And both types of creators can be successful. So um, even just like, I'll give you a very concrete example. So over the past week, I was at Duke giving us a class for a couple of their social media classes. And uh, with me was a creator called Jordan the Stallion. He's like one of the top creators in the world right now. He has yeah, like yeah. over He's... 50, like 40 something million across platforms. And I'm like, do you look at your analytics? He's like, bro, I've never looked at this in my <laughs> life. <laughs> like, but he has a very intuitive understanding of his audience. He's like, every time I make a video, I put myself in the audience shoes and I think like, what would they find interesting? What would they take away from this video? 
And he has a good sense of like certain videos has might hit with like a select group of audience, but it's not going to go super viral. So like sometimes he makes a video that doesn't post it just because he knows that in his head. Right. But I don't like I'm not like I'm not so much like vibes as him. So like I uh, use data to inform my decisions because that's what I'm comfortable with. But whatever works for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I think we need to learn. I, I would probably have followed up with other questions with him if he read comments because that's data too it's like how do you how do you respond that they actually yeah for sure he reads content? comments yeah, yeah 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 and so yeah. and so that that's data that's giving him feedback of oh that worked or oh that didn't work maybe he might not look at the analytical data in youtube studio right but he is at least yeah i showed it. him a retention chart he's like whoa this is so <laughs> cool <laughs> You're just like, hey, you're like one of the biggest people. I've all never time. seen this like, before. <laughs> that, that's but so like, great. he doesn't need it. He's getting like 10 million views per video. Yeah. No, I, I love that, but understanding it, of retention. Yeah. And and I love it because he's probably going to look at that now. You know, now he's like, oh my gosh, it's so great. But um, he, he was using data. It just wasn't the traditional back end analytics. You know, he was, he was like, oh, this is where I'm putting my state of, of the viewer, what the viewer would like, and then I'm I'm uh, validating that through the comments, you know, and and then too I'm learning from the comments. So gar guaranteed, that's what uh, most creators do when they're we're in that space, um, and they do. Um, they, I found the ones that don't look at analytics. They they really hone in on, hey, did anyone post about my videos? So they might see, oh, there's a subreddit or whatever, and they go into that just to get into the psychology of the viewer. And I, I've seen it over and over and over again. So, yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's transform into shorts. Um, so um, there's not a lot of channels that work really well with shorts and long form. It just, it's just like, hey, you might be building two separate audiences or whatever. Um, how did you approach shorts? Um, and when, when did you actually start? Like, what, when did you actually say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do some shorts and, and, um, and what, what was your thought process in this? Um, my, my shorts pr process was actually like, it was kind of interesting. So, um, I didn't take shorts seriously until uh, the past year. Yep. And before that I was just like posting clips. So like I had this series that I was doing while in on law form called a one inch punch. I basically like challenged people to the one inch punch. And those were like really like clippable because I would film, I don't know, like 50 different interactions and each yep. interaction can be made into a short. So if you like uh, just scroll down, like just a little bit, like you can just more like scroll. Uh, let me let me just let me just do the latest and then we yeah, can kind of get on. Yeah, we can go so there. like all I did like two years ago was um, just keep going a little bit more, like yep. all the way down basically. Uh, more and more and more and more. Yeah, 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 yeah. There, there, there. Yeah. There. Wait, 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 wait. That's a, that's at Vince Summit <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like I was just posting clips, <laughs> and because I wasn't taking shorts seriously, I'm like, yeah. I'll just do whatever is easy, and they were working. Like some of them had like couple million views. Well, tell, um, tell, tell everybody why you're on crutches right there. <laughs> oh, it was like one of the challenges I did. It was like a skateboarding challenge. And then yeah, yeah. I broke my ankle. <laughs> you're like, I don't know if I can post videos. That's so funny. Um, I mean, um, I did yeah. not. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, um, and then the shorts started like picking up after I doing like started doing all these like clips and stuff i started getting like 20 million views per month just from shorts and i was like yep. putting no effort in i'm like that's interesting what would happen if i actually like, tried and that's when i really found success so like the first video that i've tried is how strong is your one inch punch yeah right here the yeah. one with the bicep flexing um so like i put a lot of effort into that one well actually i i put a lot of effort comparative to like clipping and that one like it just went super web viral and yep. like that's how i got started like actually creating um unique pieces of short form content yeah and what i love is it's in line with your other content too right so a lot of people will just post shorts like ah, oh, it doesn't matter what they do whatever but you had a one inch punch video 
You had, um, you know, a Rubik's Cube video. And and um, was this before or after, like this video, was this before or after you did the, uh, before you tested the long form? Uh, we filmed at the same time. So Sue okay. came in that video too, so yeah. That, that's, that's great, that's great. And then, oh, that's really cool too. Can you beat the Rubik's Cube uh, robot? Um, that's so cool. So, yeah, so when I was thinking about like long form videos, I also think about like what shorts can be made. Like it doesn't have to be clipped. It can be like because like long form, I have everything set up, right? Um, like I have the people there, I have the uh, like props there. So filming a short is very easy compared to like setting everything up from scratch. So when you're doing your planning for your long form video, you're like, okay, what what type of shorts can we do? Or is it more, hey, we can grab this, it might be in the video and it could be a short, or how, how are you How are you processing that? No, I plan it like as two different categories. It's like, this That's is great. a long form segment, and then these are the shorts that we can film while we're filming the long form. Yeah. And let's go to your uh, most popular short and let's kind of discuss that. Like, what, like, why was this the most popular short? The one inch punch, can you break this board? Um. Well, I mean, like one inch punch was a proven topic at the time. So like that did really well. And also, I think obviously the people who saw my long form probably like saw the short as well. So it got promoted pretty fast out there. And yeah. then also it has good retention. Uh, like no one breaks it until the very end. So like that's a very good retention. And then also um, I think it's just like a very broadly appealing topic yep so it was like oh these boards are easy to break and then you go out there and they're not easy to break until and then it, when it when when it breaks that's the end of the video and so they have to watch again if they, they go again so you probably had some yeah there's attention. like three levels of boards there's like the easy yeah. medium and hard and no one breaks a hard one until the very end exactly exactly and then this one is not necessarily like, hey, maybe it's like a curiosity. I'm learning this. Like, what happens when you trap a smoke, uh, you know, trap smoke in a box? Um, but it doesn't necessarily follow your format. Um, why Why do you think this one performed? And then two, did, did this actually get people to watch your other content? Or do you feel like it was just, eh, it was just over here and it was just something that brought you some, some short views? Um. I mean, like my short strat, like my shorts content has transitioned over time. So it's now like more just like general, like fun experiments type of shorts. Yep. That's uh, my shorts are like a lot less serious than my long form. Yep. It, it, sometimes they're pretty troll. It's like, what height does a brick break? Like, it, it's like such a stupid question, <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's fun. It, it's, it's funny. Yeah. Um, so like, did it bring long form views? I mean, like yes but a small percentage but a yeah. small percentage of a big number is still a big number the, you know and saying? that and that's the that's the point that i wanted to really get on with shorts it's like um there's a short strategy that makes no sense whatsoever that will never bring long form views and it just it's just not but it's yours is about curiosity and learning and 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 learning from a master so that you have that that component of it right but it's still that curiosity. What happens when this happens? What happens if I go as a beginner and work with an expert? Where can I go? So it's there. So you still have the uh, connection of the audience. Um, but if it's so extreme out there that you're going to build another, you're going to build another audience. But yours doesn't. It's like, hey, they they might not all go into the long form, but some will, especially if it's a higher number. Um, you know, you're going to see that, that, uh, that connection over. And I know when we were on, and I, I didn't want to bring this up in, in, um, showing the analytics, but cause I don't want people to see your back end, but it, it was like, when we pulled it in, it was actually a high percentage of people that were watching your shorts is watching your long form. And, and it was because, Hey, your, your videos that you do long form, you, you put a lot of energy and effort into it and you can only put so many of those videos out, but you can do a lot more shorts and they're adjacent. They're literally adjacent to your long form content. So it kind of weaves in and, and works together and it doesn't cannibalize. 
um, your 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 long form view. In fact, it it actually helps. Um, do, have you ever used a strategy of where you try to short, and you're like, oh, this works so well. Let's do a long form, or is it just more? Is it just more lateral? Like, oh, we're gonna hit some shorts. We're, we're doing this long form that will actually um, build uh, momentum uh, to and, and recommendation to that long form video. Um, I haven't done that yet, but I, I'm gonna. I actually have a video plan that's like a test of that. That's great. That's yeah. great. Yeah, that's one of the things that I um, recommend people to do is is um, if if they're not quite sure you're like hey this would be really cool if i did that uh but i don't know if i want to put all the energy into a video um test it out use shorts to test it out see if it engages see if you can get uh comments see if you can get interactions see if you can get a, a ton of views and then if it does literally uh, i i usually plan out both videos at the same time so i have my short and then i plan out my long form so it doesn't take too much time if it starts popping off that I can have a related video come out uh, from there on the long form. So, yeah. Well, cool. Well, let's. Uh, um, is there be, before we get into uh, questions? If you have a question, go ahead and put it in the uh, the chat. Uh, we'll take super chat questions first. Um, but um, is there anything that that you learned along the way that would help just the the creator that's just kind of grinding, trying to figure things out? Yeah, I would say like. The biggest key to my success is being obsessed with learning. <laughs> like it, it's a personality trait, but it's also something you can develop because YouTube, there's so much depth to it. The, you can think about like the data side, you can think about the content side and like content is just like, in, in, like, like unlimited learning, right? Um, yeah. How do you make your videos better? And then also just like um, analyzing what does well, what doesn't do well. So like I am a part of like so many courses and stuff like that. Like I joined like Patty Galloway's course, like I joined your course, I joined like Ali Abdal's course. Like, like I just try to get any source of information I can. And even if I just learn like a single nugget like that's all I need. Exactly, exactly. I, 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 I feel the same way. It's just like, get as much information, internalize it, what's gonna work for you. And if you just get that that golden nugget, you know, that's great. You know, that helps you make better content or see YouTube maybe through the eyes of someone else. And you're like, oh, I never thought about that. I wonder if it can work for me or whatever. It's great. Um, so let me go ahead and here's a couple questions that came in. This one's from Christian. How do you get your editor to understand your editing style and goal with the video? And how do you work with an editor when you also have some uh, voiceover in your videos? Um, yeah, this is, this is like very hard in the beginning. Um, just like when I was editing the Kung Fu videos, I was working with an editor, but then I still ended up doing like half of the work. I still ended up editing half the video. I think um, a big part of it is I didn't even know what style I wanted at the time. <laughs> so like I was doing a lot of back and forth. Like I was like piecing together the video in the edit. Yeah. But now I piece the video together mostly before I even like film. Yeah. So like having a very concrete structure in mind for the editor really helps. So like I write like outlines and stuff. Um, and then also like I give them uh, kind of like some people call them looms, but I just like screen record and explain what I want. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll tell you, this is a tough one um, just because the edit can change so much of what the content is and you want to make sure you have the elements in. And sometimes when you hire a brand new editor, they don't know your style. Um, I, I normally hire uh, three or four editors at the same time and I have them edit the same thing. And I want to know who I can work with very quickly. And then to the people that I give instruction to, um, I want to see that. But the first thing I have them do is re-edit an old video. Um, I'm, I'm like, hey, watch this video, re-edit it, here's the, the stuff, and let's see if you get it. 
some people don't even uh, uh, watch the, the video to edit it. They just edit it. And I'm like, okay, you're gone. You didn't follow instructions. You're out of here. Uh, but those that do, um, they're like, oh, okay. And then I'm like, okay, now what would you do to, to enhance it? And that's that first, that, that first uh, iteration. And some of those come back really amazing. I'm like, I never thought about doing it. That's so good. But they at least have kind of the mechanism. And I know that they find, um, you know, they, they, they find the, the pattern and the rhythm of the edit. Uh, but once once I get that, it's just like, okay, they need to have what a, what a good edit looks like and the elements of what those good edits are and then to the progression of the edit. Um, and some editors, they get it innately and others don't. And I would say if they, if they won't learn and grow with you, get rid of them because it's not worth it. Or just make them an assembly editor or make them something that, you know, can help speed up your process as an editor. But... Uh, great, great, great question, uh, Christian, on that. I appreciate that. We also have a super chat. Thank you for this amazing interview, Shani. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, also, let's go here. We got John Pullum here. Uh, do you ever use AI to get video ideas? And if so, how? And then are your videos dubbed in various languages or other channels in various languages? Um, I... I I looked into AI. Um, I don't really use it too often in the video uh, ideation process. Um, and in terms of dubbing, right now they're not dubbed, but that's something I do plan on doing in the future. And I know Daryl has a lot of like dubbing strategies. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good. Um, John, I think for me too, it's like... I think AI is a tool and um, I'm a visual idea person. So like when I, when I see a thumbnail or I go to Google images and I start looking at topics, um, I, I can, I'll, I'll come up with a million ideas or uh, someone would, would say, oh, here it would be cool if you could do this. And then my mind goes, oh yeah, but we could do this. And then it, my, my mind goes off. I cannot for the right mind ever get a good video idea out of the AI because of the way that I, get my ideas yeah um and, and i'm so, here yeah it's like a very like it's like a loose process right like it's like yeah. one thing inspires another thing and I, I just find it like better to do that with real people yeah and i do know that some people uh they they get their ideas from lists you know and you can use ai to get the lists and that might spur on ideas of what would work you know uh, but uh, I think ultimately at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's really about what works best for you. And I'm, I'm a more of a visual idea guy, um, for me. So it sounds like, uh, Hafu's the same. All right. Um, here's, here's a question. Um, what would your strategy f uh, be for a launch day of a new channel? Five long forms, five shorts, what would make the most impact to find the right audience to grow? So if you're launching a new channel, what would you do? Yeah, I mean, like that, that's a great strategy. Um, uh, upload a bunch of videos first and then like um, have a library for the people to watch. And I know like you talked about this before, so uh, why don't you give your thoughts? Well, I, they, so Matt Pat said he would, he would upload five videos. I say three. Um, now, Matt Pat is great and he's grown and all that other stuff that's great. And I think it's just more... Um, I think you can do a lot with three videos and then I just want to be just consistent after that. It's just like, if I have a, you know, a brand new channel with three videos, I have three chances to really pull someone in. And then for those that don't know this, YouTube actually gives a little bit extra love for brand new channels. Um, they just, just a little bit of just seeing who the audience is, make sure that those three videos are not polar opposites. They need to, they need to impact the, the same viewer. Because because what happens if they watch one of them, there's a high probability that the other uh, other two videos could be in the uh, up next um, or or when they go back to the home page on the home page. And so if we can get them to click two or three videos at that time and, and binge watch or they watch one and, and go through suggestion or go back to the home page, that will give the, the um, AI that YouTube uses enough information of, oh, this type of viewer likes us, let's put it in front of more of those viewers and that's where you're able to grow um, substantially. So um, I don't know if I would do shorts though for me. If, if, I was, if, if I was doing long form, 
Um, I, shorts, um, and, and let me let me kind of explain why because I think this is um, just my own my own belief. But um, there's no choice in shorts. No one gets to choose what they see. It's just like you you swipe up, you get to see, right? I like long form because they have to make a choice and and click, and and then they, they can go deeper and click. And so there is that choice. And I found that if I can get that to happen, uh, I can grow faster. Now shorts, I think I can get more views and I can get subscribers, but they're not loyal to me. They're just they just like the content, and and I want them to get loyal to the channel. Um, and that's that's just something that I'd look at. I don't know. If, any other thoughts on that? I do think there is a short strategy that could work that would promote the long form views, but that's getting pretty technical. Well, let's hear it. Like we're technical people, bro. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's let's hear it. Yeah, I mean, so like for me, I have like a couple of styles of shorts. One of the styles is like a short that's promoting a long form. And at the end, I have like a CTA to like call to action, just like click here to watch the long form videos. And I've found those convert long form audiences better than like any other type of shorts. One, one million percent. I, w I would not disagree with that. I would not disagree with that at all. So that's great. Okay, let's do uh, another one. Um, so this is from AJ. Do you use the research tab to get your ideas for new videos? The research tab? What is that? Oh, so, on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On YouTube. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, never. Like, it's kind of useless. <laughs> we love you, YouTube. <laughs> um, uh, AJ, he actually uh, does a pitch meeting. So he has everyone in his company brings an idea together and it's out seeing what's happening on YouTube, things that's going in, in on the internet and they're coming back with ideas uh, that leads to what videos they're gonna do. And I think those ideas would be, oh, it'd be really cool if we did this or our audience would really love if we did that. Okay, um, one thing I would say, like, okay, the research tab, has gotten a lot better like in when it was first released all it gave was like keywords and i feel like uh, those what wasn't a accurate representation of what was happening on my channel but nowadays there's a lot more information in the research tab and the audience tab too so like yeah. it shows you content that you're uh that's like similar to your channel um and other creators that like your audiences watch and i find that pretty valuable and even nowadays like on the um, research tab, there's like recent videos. It's like videos that like were popular in your niche. So like that's actually very valuable now. So like over time, it has gotten a lot better, and I've been using it more and more. Yeah, I I like to go through um, YouTube and just go to the real time analytics, see what's happening right now, and then I like to use the audience tab because that's one of the most underutilized uh, tabs that people should use. And, and I'd really like to see what people are binge watching. So it's like, I already know where they're getting content, but then it's like, oh, the new viewer, like this video uh, brought in a new viewer or it converted a new viewer and seeing that, it gives me, okay, what are some ideas I can do around that? Uh, because then, then it's just like, oh, it's not a 180 uh, pivot. There's some idea out there is to be, okay, what can I do with this? And if I can't come up with an idea, I want to go do some research to try to come up with an idea. Um, and then when I have that, that's generally when I go, okay, is there anything else that I can do? And I, I want to get 30, 40, 50 video ideas, um, but I want to hone in, oh, it'd be really cool if we did this, but this would be maybe not a video, but it could be in this video. You know, I, I, do, I, I do a lot of that, so. Yeah. Okay, cool. We'll do, we'll take uh, just a few more questions and then we'll um, go from there. Here's another one. Uh, started how to draw uh, or how to draw channel focusing on tutorials through storytelling. How do you balance the ratio between education and entertainment uh, viewer versus buyer? Honestly, I would say that depends on your goal for the channel. It's like, are you trying to like sell education or are you trying to like make entertaining YouTube videos and have that be your primary income source. So it's like, it all depends. Yeah, I would say I would rather um, be an entertainment channel that happens to focus in on drawing tutorials and do it in a fun way um, and, and be really clever on that. And then that will always uh, uh, give you more opportunity to sell. Cause like it, it will, like you'll have buyers that will go through it. I just, I've seen it uh, very specifically um, with that. 
Um, and so I, I kind of lean towards that because then that's if you're you're a content creator that happens to do uh, you know um, tutorials, that's great. And then when you have something to offer, people are like, oh, I really love this. I want to go deeper. And like what you said earlier, the more views that you have, more visibility you have, it, it, it helps on the bottom line too, because you'll actually have more customers as well. So great question. All right, uh, last question here. Uh, thank you so much for this. Hafu, can you detail on how recon and research process works for you uh, best to identify trends that are hot? Or is there any plugins that you use to pull patterns and stats? Yeah, how do I recognize? Yeah, that's a great question, very detailed. Um, I mean, I scroll on YouTube a lot. So like, I'm, I, like I live on YouTube. <laughs> so like, for me, I'm always looking at like, oh, let's say, for example, like this last week, I'm like, Apple Vision Pro, yep. MKBHD publishes a video that gets like 10 million views within a day. Like, yep. obviously, I'm like, wow, there's a lot of interest in that video. And then I see other people publishing the same topic and still getting a lot of views. Okay, I'm like, okay, that's probably a trend right now. Um, and then also uh, plugins, like, there's a bunch of plugins. Um, but, like, the main ones I use is, like, stuff that would give me a um, view to, like, like a multiplier basically on their average views. So there's like vidIQ that does that, TubeBuddy does that. Um, there's other plugins that does that, like plenty of stuff. Yeah, I, I would say um, there's so many of you and 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 I, I and I want to be clear that some of you watch a lot of YouTube, but you watch YouTube educational videos instead of watching YouTube. And, and I'm, I'm a firm believer of if you want to improve at YouTube, you gotta see, you gotta, you gotta go out in YouTube in the wild, see what's happening, watch videos and ask, okay, why do they do this? Why do they choose this thumbnail? Why do they use this title? Why are they doing this? Oh, this is really clever, they did this. Why didn't they do it this way? Um, and, and do less YouTube education of, here's how to get views on YouTube. Now, that's contradicts of you coming on and watching these live streams, but realistically, that's what you need to do. <laughs> it's just like, see what's actually happening on YouTube and figure out, oh, I see these patterns. What can I do to do it here? And maybe it's there's nothing you can do. Maybe there's nothing at all that you can do because it's not relevant to your viewer, but at least get you the idea of seeing what's happening. And then two, um, you're getting very specific on your ideation process. And so a lot of, uh, of people that do one-on-ones with me or they come into my mentoring program, they don't even watch YouTube. I'm like, how are you going to succeed if you don't even watch the, the platform and understand what's happening on the platform? Um, you know, if, if you're not doing that, how are you going to succeed? You know, so I, I just really, really, really love that. Um, I'm going to end on this yeah, one. Can I just add a quick thing yeah, on that? Please do, please do. Um, so like, I do think there's value in these live streams and YouTube educators because they give you like a framework in order to process all the data you'll get, but in order to gather the data, you still need to go watch YouTube and see what's working and what's not working. Very well said. Very well said. See, you said that better than me. <laughs> watch my live <laughs> streams, figure it out and then go out. Yeah, for, for sure. Um, uh, uh, so this one says, congratulations on your success, your channel. Uh, Hafu Go, you're giving a lot of ton of value. Um, I'm in chapter 15 of the YouTube formula. There we go, this book right here. Nice. Um, and she's increased her watch hours by 4X, I love it. Um, so uh, super excited for those that, um, you know, want to learn. I have a 30 day creator challenge. You can find it in the, the description below or you can buy my book. It's in, I think 10 languages now. I, we just got a brand new book, it's in Spanish. Um, little little bitter on this one, on the Spanish one, because I do speak Spanish, and they used the YouTube formula, the magical formula, instead of the YouTube formula, because it's the scientific, the scientific formula. Uh, but anyway, it is what it is. The, I, hopefully, I haven't read the book yet in Spanish, but hopefully they didn't change too much in it. So, oh, that's a um, different cover. Yeah, it is a different cover. Yeah, like here's here's my Thai, um, my Thai one, so you can oh, see. Wow. That that's pretty crazy, huh? So, but yeah, yeah, I got that. And my my favorite one, uh, the title one, is the German title, and the reason why it says "Die YouTube." <laughs> Like, Live so, YouTube and die YouTube. Yeah, die YouTube. I'm like, 
<laughs> when I first saw it, I'm like, what the heck? Kill off YouTube. No, but I uh, definitely love it. So, um, but yeah, you can find all the stuff in the description below. And then two, Hafu, I, I have one last question for you. And this is probably uh, one of the most important questions. And you don't need to answer to me now if you don't want to answer me now. You can say, I'll hold it later. But every year I bring all these YouTubers together. And, and we have uh, an amazing conference called Vid Summit. Would you be willing to speak at Vid Summit, man? Wow. Yeah, I mean, I would love to speak at Vid Summit. Dude, like, I, I, I have, I've attended Vid Summit like for the past two years. I, mean, I know. That, that would be like, so big great. honor for me. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really think that the people at Vid Summit will learn so much more from you and i'm really excited i'll get the details i'm really excited about it and the reason why i love vid summit is it gives a platform for people to get up and share what they know and you've been doing this so long and there's so much value you brought in this live stream and i know that you can bring a lot of value there at vid summit so i'm, I'm super excited to have you uh be there this thank you so much yeah um, All right. can i just ask one question to the chat can everyone type in chat what your biggest takeaway was I, I would just love to see that. Yeah, let's let's have you do that. What in on this live stream? What was the biggest takeaway that you learned here? Um, and and we'll kind of put some of these up here real quick. Yeah, because like yeah. I've been monitoring chat the entire time, and like uh, people were, like they were asking a lot of questions, but I want to hear your takeaways, like what you're yeah. learning. Takeaways is see, he is a student. He loves to learn and he wants to understand what you learned from this, this process right here. I like this one. Being a YouTuber is like going to college again. I do. I think you need to be a student of YouTube. You do. You have to be a student of YouTube. Um, let's see a lot here. of, a lot of people talking about the planning and research process. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. I will try to challenge you course. to see. Oh, this one's a good one. Uh, try, learn, uh, try, test, learn, repeat. Yep, yep, love that. Yeah, You're, um, right. they're, they're coming in quick here, so. And some people are learning that uh, not pivoting 180, that's good, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that was some solid advice too, just like the small tweaks, uh, as I say, small tweaks lead to big peaks, if you just kind of slowly go there. And so many people wanna go, oh, I wanna do it now. I'm like, no, put a plan to get there. Um, and, and you'll, you'll get more impact for sure. Let's do this one. This is a good, good one here. Um, I, uh, think that you just never be afraid to experiment on YouTube and try things. That's, that was really good. You know, don't, don't, don't be stuck in your ways, which is awesome. Yeah. A lot of creators, like they find success in one thing and then they just keep on hammering that thing and not changing. And that just leads to like a slow decline in their channel. Yeah. It's called the slow death, man. <laughs> That's what I call it. It's the it's slow hockey stick of death. Um, no, I love it. So, okay. Well, very good. Well, I really do appreciate you, your time, uh, um, you know, coming on and teaching. I'm really excited that you're going to be a part of Vid Summit this year. Um, can't wait. It's going to be in September, uh, which that's going to come up quick. But what's your last bit of advice? I mean, just at the end of the live stream, what's your last bit of advice for everyone that's been with us for an hour and a half? Yeah. Um, I say this to a lot of creator friends who came up during the uh, TikTok period, which was like during COVID. Um, so I know a lot of people are short form creators right now, like strictly short form and they want to transition to long form. And I think the biggest piece of advice I will give there is you have to treat long form as a completely different game. You have to learn long form from scratch and you cannot expect the same results that you get from short form on your long form right away. So like you basically have to learn a new format and put in the time to learn that. And Daryl obviously has a lot of good information on how to learn that. So it's like you're, you're in a good place. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I love it. I love it. And I, th I think the big thing for me is surround yourself with people that actually love what they do, yeah. you know, and and have discussions, have conversations of of what you've learned and be willing to share. And that's what I love about Vid Summit. I love about my group. It's like people are willing to share and help. 
um, because you can just it, it, like like what he said. It's just that one golden nugget could be the thing that that puts all this this puzzle together for you, and you can actually do the right um, right strategy or have the right type of video that really connects or really understand the viewer on a deeper level. Uh, so Hafu, thank you so much for joining me. Thank I really you. do appreciate it. Thanks again for being a part of this live stream and being willing to speak at VidSummit. Can't wait to do that. And for all of you, thank you so much for being on this live stream. Uh, for me, it's it's my desire, my heart is to help you have a little bit of clarity of your audience, your content, how it's going to engage your content so you can grow and be successful on YouTube. So guys, thank you so much. And we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, everybody.